Thank you. Let me just share a thought from President McKay. He said this, he says, every person who lives in this world yields an influence, whether for good or for evil. It is not what he says alone. It is not alone what he does. It is what he is. Every person ra radiates what he or she really is. It is what we are and what we radiate that affects the people around us. So I like that, like that thought. Um, questions on where we are? We'll have everything graded and handed back on Wednesday, and then you guys will hand your paper in. I, you guys hand it in on Monday, a week from today at PFB. It's fun to see some of you are handing things in that are uh, you're, you're ahead of us. But uh, hopefully you feel it's a good exercise. I think any time you've taken kind of the 16 key areas of personal finance and you've worked on what's your vision, what are your goals, what are your guiding principles, what are your plans and strategies and then constraints and accountability, I, I think it can help. So uh, I appreciate that. Today we're going to talk about teaching your kids and then saving for your kids' missions and education. I'm going to start with a story. I, um, just like you do service teaching and individual experiences, I, I, whenever anyone asks me, I'll, I'll come and speak. And I was asked to speak at a ward. Um, back then it was a combined Relief Society uh, uh, quorum. And so I spoke at the ward. And I, it, it's always fun. I like to do it. I like teaching that personal finance is just part of uh, Heavenly Father's plan for his children. Um, in our family, what we do is at, when the, our kids are seniors, we do what's called a senior trip. So if it's females, they get to go with mom, and it's males, they get to go with dad. We have six daughters, so you know who does most of the traveling with the kids. Um, but it was kind of fun. It was, my, uh, it was my son, and he wanted to go to New York and go to a bunch of jazz clubs. So he's the one who graduated with his master's in jazz um, from the U. And so it was fun. We hit five jazz clubs in like three days, and during the day we'd go see plays. One day we decided we wanted to go see the Statue of Liberty. And so we were just getting ready to go onto the boat to go out to Ellis Island. And I got this phone call. And this guy goes, oh, is this Professor Sudweeks? I go, yeah. And it was a number I didn't recognize. And, and he says, well, my daughter said you did a really good job at speaking at her ward on Sunday. And I knew what it was. And <laughs> I probably wasn't the kindest person. And I says, you're not going to like what I have to say. He goes, well, you don't know what I'm, what I'm saying. You just got my phone call. I said, but you're not going to like what I have to say. And he says, well, let me explain. And I said, fine, but you're not going to like what I have to say. And he went to exp <laughs> started explaining and about his daughter, and she doesn't manage money very well. And I said, so you want me to be able to work with your daughter. Is that right? He goes, well, well how did you know? I said, it's just not hard. And then I said, I said, my guess is every time your daughter has had problems, you, the dad, come in on your white horse and shining horse, and you take out the credit card and you save your daughter from all of her mistakes. I said, sometimes the biggest problems we have is not from the people who have the problems, but it's those who are trying to help. <laughs> he didn't like what I had to say, but, but I listened to him. and He says, well, what do you recommend? I says, well, I recommend that you just let her solve it for herself. Too many times as parents, we want to jump in. We want to fix it. We've got the, you know, many of us have the resources we can, but it's not the best thing. And it's not only for parents. I got this email. It says, hi, Brother Sudwicks. I was in your class in the fall. I learned so much from your class, and I still use my budget quick until this day. My question is mainly for some counsel. I have a bro in law who's severely in debt. He has a decent job as a manager at Walmart. He has three kids all under four and a stay-at-home wife. He has always spent excessively, and unfortunately, he was mostly bailed out by his parents. Once he was left to fend for himself, he continued to spend frivolously. He now has lots of creditors calling at his door. His checks are being garnished. He's being threatened with eviction from his rental place. With all these stresses, his marriage is suffering, and I'm extremely worried for my little nephews. How can I point him in the right direction of help? I don't think that he will actually listen to me, and I don't know that I want to be too involved. Would a professional financial planner be wise? I guess my real question is, how can I best teach him the principles of prudent living and financial management without being the teacher myself? Thanks again for your class. I count as one of the most valuable classes I've taken. How do you help people? How do you help people who sometimes don't want help? 
over this weekend, we spent time in St. George and then we were down in Moab. My daughter said homeworks she had to do and my, my wife says, hey, shouldn't you be working on your homework? <laughs> she was honest and she says, mom, every time you say that, it makes me not want to do my homework. <laughs> but how do we help people, family and friends? How would you respond to that email? Pardon me? Yeah, if you can figure it out, let me know. I know, and it's a tough one. And the challenge is often we're not willing to help. Um, or we're not willing to ask for help until we're real seriously in debt. There's like, Jesse, it's good to hear from you. It's interesting how your bro in law has been bailed out by his parents. I just declined to co-sign with my, one of my kids for a car today and they're not too happy. This strategy of letting them learn by themselves will pay off on the long run though and I said a few other things. I hate to say it but it, until he hurts enough to ask for help there's probably little you can do. Just continue to be yourself, kind, thoughtful not, and non-judgmental and helpful to his family. I suggest that you do not bail him out until his habits change, little is going to help. Sorry, but until he wants and is willing to listen to help, there's not much you can do. I've had people come to me for help. And, um, and I tell them right up the front, I said, unless you do exactly what I tell you, I'm not willing to help. Because you have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired enough to be able to listen to what I have to say. So, so it's challenges. And then also leads to, and how do you help your kids? How do you teach your children? Let me tell you another couple more stories. Needless to say, I, I like dogs, but I like outside dogs. And after we had our seventh child, my wife decided, you know, it'd be interesting to get a dog. And, and I, I had memories. I had a Hungarian Beesla and an a, a Irish Setter growing up. Um, but they were outside dogs. So I wanted nothing to do with the dog. So I says, you know what? It's okay to get a dog. It's number one, as long as all the kids pay for it. Number two, as long as the kids do all the work. Number three, as long as I don't have to touch the dog. So I, I thought, I, okay, that, that, I'm sure, um, I, I'm sure that, was, that was enough. She could sense that, that I didn't want to have a dog. That afternoon when I came home, <laughs> the youngest, when she was about two or three, I opened the door and she, she saw me and she goes, <laughs> she ran into the kitchen and I know something bad was about to happen. And we had a dog. We had a uh, miniature schnauzer. So we went for a while and then my wife got the idea, wouldn't it be fun to, to have puppies to breed the dog? You know, and you always wonder, are you teaching your kids well enough? Are you teaching them about finance? You know, and so, <laughs> bred the dog, I think we had five puppies. Um, and they say, Cook, can we keep some of them? Can we keep some of them? I said, no way. We are going to sell every single one of those puppies. <laughs> so one went to the, uh, the, the breeder dog, and so we had four puppies. And I sold two of them to uh, friends for 400 each, and then we sold two of them to people we didn't know for 600 each. And, you know. So we thought, you know, that's good. Now I've gotten rid of all those dogs. I've dodged that bullet. And then it was about, I think it was November or December. One of my kids came to me and said, Dad, did we buy that dog? I go, yeah, you did. Pause for a second. Dad, do we take care of the dog? <laughs> they said, yeah, most of the time. Sometimes I have to clean up after the dog, which I'm not very happy about. Dad, how much money did we make from <laughs> selling the puppies? So I counted 600, 1,200, plus about two grand. Dad, do we get a dividend? <laughs> <laughs> then I'm realizing that, that maybe, maybe they're learning a little bit, even if it's subconsciously. Um, another story, <laughs> came home and my daughter was coming out of the door and she had a box. It looked like some shoe box. And I go, hey, what'd you buy? <laughs> she goes, Dad, I got some shoes. She says, you're making me scared to spend money. And I smiled and I said, I'm doing my job. <laughs> and the final story is, <clears throat> in, in our family, we have a spreadsheet. And so when the kids earn money, they give it to dad and we'll 
10% in a tithing column and um, 30% for mission and education and they can spend the rest of it. And when one of my kids was going to college, they said, you know, and then what happens, so let me tell you what happens is then at the end of the year when we go into tithing settlement, I just add up all the tithing and then I put, write a check for it. So because it's the LDS church, then I can count that on my TA. Well. So it's a little, little, little tr tricks there, the trade, but, you know, she, she was in college for two or three months and then she says, Dad, I don't know how to pay my tithing no more because we just did that. And I thought, that's interesting, that's really strange. That's not a problem that I thought we would have. Um, but, but the point here is we have to teach our kids. And if we don't teach them, no one else will. Um, you know, I have a quick question. Okay. So, well, I was like, actually a couple weeks ago. We went to Disney World. Well, how many times did we get that? And I was the last one. And my son's like, not another financial. <laughs> <laughs> and so then last week when my husband went to the lesson, he's like, yeah, Jaden's not going to like this lesson. So <laughs> this is not going to But when I ask him questions, they know they can answer yeah. them. And so it's, it's good. But they do have to teach them. They yeah. just learn it magically. Yeah, they don't learn it magically. And you have to hold them accountable. You know, we've saved a certain amount of money for our kids' education. And I actually have one of my children who still hasn't finished her degree who's pretty close to that amount. And in the last couple of weeks, we had to say, look, you're, you're running low on your education funds. You might, be, you might try to cons uh, consolidate or <laughs> try to be wise things. But what are the challenges? What are the principles? And what are the practices of teaching your children? Reminds me of the joke that when I was first married, we had seven theories on raising kids and no kids. Now we have seven kids and no theories. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. So what are the challenges of teaching your kids finance? How many people here have kids? A couple of you. Don't have the... uh, they're all different. You know, one of the big ones, communication. You know, how do you communicate with them? And if you're like my kids, you know, once you're reminded about it, that's the last thing they want to do is whatever you tell them to do. So, this is really interesting. So, my oldest two kids, but, and you know Addie. Mm -hmm. So, Addie hoards her money and... But then on video games, she, like, spends it all. <laughs> and then my son, he spends all his money and hoards it on video games. <laughs> like, There's differences. So they're, they're just, yeah, they're different. It's funny. Yeah. No, and, and the differences between your kids. And to realize fair does not necessarily equal equal. You can be fair to your kids and still have different amounts. So what are the challenges and what are the principles? How did your parents teach you? Ben, how did your parents teach you about finances? Uh, I'd say mainly by example. Okay. I don't remember like, any specific lessons or anything, except for about tithing, I guess. Yeah. I, I grew up, we had our little box. It was 10% tithing, mission, and then you could spend. So we had those three things. Yeah, Jenny. My parents would teach us, um, we were expected to do certain chores, but if we wanted to make money, we could do extra work. And then they would try to teach us about investments. So say, if we give it back to them, uh -huh. in three months, our money could double. So they're trying to teach us some principles that way. I was talking to my kids. I said, you know, we have a, a large yard, so that's where we put them. They have to do their two hours, and then after that, we'll pay them. I said, hey, you want to come out and work in the yard? We've finished our two hours. And they go, no. <laughs> I go, well, well, I'll pay you. And, uh, I can't remember the ages. They were like five and seven. So I'll pay you like six bucks an hour, something like this, which I thought was generous. And they go, no, we're going to go do a, a lemonade stand. And so they put the lemonade <laughs> into the wagon. They went down the end of the street. <laughs> An hour and a half later, they came back. And how much did you make? Oh, we only made 20 bucks. <laughs> I'm just going, a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but <clears throat> point here is, 
how are you taught? Yeah. So one thing, um, not necessarily with my parents, but um, with my kids, like one thing that we've done is we have like and everybody does it different, but um, we give them we give them allowance, and it's only because, and I don't actually like tying it to chores because I think they just have to do chores because they live there. But I do want them to have some money to learn how to manage it, mm -hmm. and we just do like however old they are, or um, that's how much they get. But then they put fifty percent into savings. Fifty percent. Well, they do 10%, they do their tithing first, and then 50% goes into the savings. <coughs> they get like half their age, right? It's uh -huh. not very much, but it is enough that if they want to save up yeah. for something, or anyway, so they pay their tithing and then they put some into savings. And it's just something, and then if dad forgets to pay him for that month, there's a penalty charge. <coughs> he has to pay. That adds up even more than their allowance. Yeah. And we've done lots of those things. We started with, a, you know, we have our chores. You have daily chores. You have weekly chores. And then my kids also have to work in the yard for two hours every Saturday. And we've done that. And then we started paying, tying the allowance to that. Um, and what we did, um, I think you can, st you can still see this even though the screen's not down. This is our spreadsheet. You know, tithing, 10%, mission and education, 30%, personal. A <laughs> couple of interesting things here. Um, notice this retainer minus $200. You know, one of the Sudbeef curses is bad eyes and bad teeth. So <laughs> we, have, we all have contacts or things like that. But he lost his retainer. And we said, Less, you know what? If you don't find it, you're going to have to pay for it. Well, I, it's not my fault. I didn't, you know. He said, sorry. So he paid $200 for that retainer. Guess how many of my other kids lost their retainers? Not a single one. <laughs> you know, other little things here. So uh, you can see tithing settlement there. Um, drum sets, what we decided, when I was a kid growing up, my parents would uh, pay half of something. So I wanted a mini bike. So I don't know if you guys aren't old enough to know what a Honda Mini Trail 50 is, but they bought that for me and then I, they, they paid half and I paid back the other half and I wanted a trumpet. And I just thought, you know, that's not a good thing to have your kids basically go into debt. So what we said in our family is, first of all, you come up with your half, and then we'll pay half on things that are important to them. So you can see here was a drum set. We paid half on that. And you can just see different things. Uh, shopping for cost of second phone, <laughs> tithing settlement, money for Christmas, um, a Moab shirt. But what, what we did is... Um, we would pay half, and then when they earn money, it would go into this account, 10% tithing, 30% mission and education. And even now, we still have this spreadsheet. So my daughter is you know, paying her tuition. We, she puts, saves a certain percentage, and then we'll match that. And that, that goes against their education stuff. Um, other thoughts on teaching your kids? So along the lines of now that we're talking about, I do remember whenever we were like, at the grocery store with my mom and wanted a candy bar or something. She would always say, did you bring your money? Yeah. And like, so she just expected us to pay for our own stuff. In ours, is we, we, you saw in that thing, you had your money. Yeah. And our kids wanted something, they say, well, just take it out of my account. <laughs> it was really funny. We were on a family vacation with cousins. And, and Kylie, I think she was about five. She was, we were at Disneyland, someplace like that, and she was with my aunt. <laughs> and uh, she wanted to get something. She goes, oh, take it out of my account. And my aunt turned to her and said, Kylie, you don't have an account with me. <laughs> but, but, but it's really important that, that we think through these things. Um, One thing that um, Addie would say when she's little, she said, Mom, is it on sale? I always tell them, is it on sale? It's on sale. You can't buy it if it's on sale. When they were little, that's how I get them through. Like, yeah. I, <laughs> I remember one time uh, my wife was driving and I was in the passenger seat and our, our youngest daughter was about three. And she was back there, and all of a sudden she blurted out, I want to be a mom. And I thought, oh, this has got to be good. <laughs> so I turned back and said, I said, why do you want to be a mom? And she put her chin on two fingers and she says, because moms have all the money. <laughs> I thought that was it's kind of interesting, her observations here. But this is from The Motley Fool, and it says, 10 things to teach your kids about money. So talking with your kids about money is tough. We've known parents who would rather explain to their four-year-old's wife 
Bambi's mama isn't coming home to reveal how much money they make. And we think that's a shame. You may not owe your kids a car when they turn 16. You may not owe them a college education. You may not even owe them an allowance, but you do owe them an education in money. To get you started with your curriculum, here are 10 lessons about money that every child should learn before they start out on their own. Number one, debt sucks. Yeah, adults know that language too. You may not normally use such blunt language. That's okay. The shock will give your words maximum, friend. Or you could say, when you're in debt, you give someone else control of your life, honey. That's a bad thing. Credit card companies are in business to make money, not to help you out. Though it may seem like they really like you. After all, they send you convenience checks and give you perks like airline miles. Their true mission is to keep you in debt until you die. That said, credit cards can be a wonderful thing if you don't let them trick you into spending more than you have. Two, pay yourself first. No, that doesn't mean buying a new DVD player with your first paycheck. It means putting money away for emergencies and goals. Your savings account can keep you out of debt when you hit those inevitable potholes in the road of life. Debt enslaves you, but a saving account keeps you free. Three, it's the small things that get you. You could drop $4 on a Frappuccino at Starbucks or a silver hoop nose ring every day or not. Investing $4 a day in the stock market could earn you more than a quarter million bucks in 30 years which will be a latte now or a lot of speedboats in the future. Four, invest in market index. Savings accounts are great for emergencies and short-term goals, but to reach your long-term goals, you need the power of the stock market. With index investing, it's simple to get market matching returns that over time will make you rich. The best part, maybe you can refer to yourself as a stockholder at your friend's birthday parties. You know, I was checking on this, realized my kid's education, over half of it's been paid by market appreciation. One daughter that, my youngest, who's down there at, at Dixie, and so she's on scholarship. She's got a, an academic plus a, a performance scholarship. And just realized that her education money increased by almost 24% just this year alone because the stock market's up 24%. And what, I, what we did with most of our kids, we just stuck them in a, either a, a S&P 500 index or a total stock market index. And that's what we did. Five, start a Roth IRA as soon as you start earning money. Think of it as saving for financial independence instead of retirement. Whatever call, you call it, investing early beats saving late every time. A maxed out Roth invested in an index fund can make you a tax-free multimillionaire. Four, take a deep breath. Let me show you the family budget. Here's how much money we make. Looks like a fortune, right? Okay, here's where it goes. Now this much goes for taxes right off the top. Now we subtract the much for savings. And this for the mortgage, and this for the car, and this for your college account, and this for food. Hey, wake up. You'll put them to sleep. Seven, budget isn't a bad word. You need a budget to track your income, allowances, cash gifts, babysitting, lawn mowing money, and your expenses. You can figure out how long it will take you to save up for those rollerblades or rocket boots you want. Budgeting doesn't have to be hard. It's as simple as A, B, C. A, pay yourself. B, pay your bills. C, spend no more than what's left. Eight, keeping up with the Joneses or P. Diddy's is a sucker's game. Read The Millionaire Next Door. The Joneses could be head over heels in debt and sick and hard over it. P. Diddy's new BMW convertible is probably the least. Don't let the glitter feel it fool you. Nine, don't trust anyone. When it comes to your money, you can't abdicate responsibility. Many financial advisors have conflicts of interest. Their advice is to maximize their commissions, not your money. Others are simply incompetent. No one cares as much about your money as you do, except your parents who only want for you the best for you. Since anyone can get market matching returns easily and inexpensively through index investing, you'll, need to, you'll never need to rely on expensive advisors who will think of you as an ATM. 10. Money can't buy happiness but lo or love, but it can help you avoid many kinds of misery. You have to find your own happiness, but it's easier when economic hardship isn't dominating your life. So don't even try to buy happiness. Instead, buy security for yourself and your loved ones, then find happiness in them. Also from this last week, come follow me. I, I was impressed on that article on joy. It says joy and happiness comes not because of our circumstances, becomes, but because, because of our focus. And if our focus is Jesus Christ, then we can have that joy and that happiness there. So, interesting things. I would, I would agree with that 100%. So the two things my grandfather taught me was one, nobody takes care of money. Nobody's gonna take care of your money like you do. And then two, when I was like five or six, I don't know, I was little and I got all this birthday money 
and I was so excited, and I was up at my grandpa's house, and I said, hey, Grandpa, look, I see that, that I got all this money. And he said, how about you give me that money, and I'll save it for when you really need it, and I'll invest it for you. And I was like, because he's like, because one day you're going to need it. You're gonna, you know, and he taught mm -hmm. me, in that moment, he taught me the importance of saving for an emergency. And I gave him my money, and my mom was so mad. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I did, and I'll tell you that the dividend on that money was actually really good. But um, I, I I'm impressed that you, how old were you? I'm, I was impressed that you that you would be willing to give that money. That says a lot. I trusted my grandfather, but it was I think it was kind of what he said. He said, you know, one day you're going to need it, uh -huh. and you need to save. It was that blessing, and then you never forgot that blessing. Yeah. I'll have to remember that. If my grandfather would have said that. I said, no way, I'm keeping it. Money. <laughs> so what are the principles of, what are the guiding principles of teaching your kids? You know, one of the challenges, most people don't know themselves. So how can you teach your kids when you don't know? And so people have been really averse to teaching them. Here's just, just some ones that I've thought about it. That I've thought about. Understanding yourself. What are your visions and your goals? What do you want for your kids? Number two, to act and receive on the Spirit's guidance. I'm, I love the come follow me things here because it's saying we all can receive it, guidance and inspiration. And we need to if we're going to be able to accomplish what we need to in this life. Teaching by example, we cover that. Paying a full tithe and offering. Teaching the importance of work. When I was a kid growing up, what we did is we had, my dad had a warehouse there on Brownstone Road in Oakley. And about the last, about half of it was just a bunch of walnut, walnut trees. And what we did to save for Help for Kids Missions and Education is every year when the walnuts were ready to be harvested, we'd take these big tarps and just put them around the trees. And then you'd get these things, look like sledgehammers, but just had the rubber mallets. And then you would hit the branches. And the sad part, you'd do this when it was 105 degrees outside. And what happens, it's a, a, it's a very sandy area. And so the sand and the dirt that would be on the trees would come down, plus the bugs. Sometimes there were some fairly large bugs there. And so you're sitting here in high temperature and you're sweating and all this dirt comes down. So it was not the most fun thing that you'd want to do. In fact, that probably helped ensure me that I didn't want to be a farmer. <laughs> you know. But I can remember doing that and we'd do that every year. And I remember one year we'd, we'd take those things, once we'd got, got the tarps, we'd put the walnuts in uh, bags, in the burlap bags, then we'd take those down to the whole ones. And one time we had a pallet out in front and we had like, you know, a dozen uh, bags of walnuts on it. And when we came back the next day, someone had stolen all of our walnuts. And I came back and I was just mad. I was mad. All this, you know, this is, this is mission, this is education money, and things like this. And I couldn't understand why my dad was, wasn't mad. And I think his view was the importance of it was he's teaching his kids to work and work for a good cause. He wasn't teaching them just, just for the money. And I think as we, as we raise our kids, as we work with them, we've got to realize that's an important thing to do is to teach. Um, teach we all contribute to family welfare. And then teach to be honest with your finances. We, yeah, on, um, on Thursday, we were down in Moab, and we were in the Sand Flats Recreation Area. Some of you may know that area. And we were getting ready to do uh, fins and things uh, on, on, on the razor, which was really fun. And it was five bucks to get in, and you, you paid yourself. And, and you know what? We didn't have a five. All we had was a 20. <laughs> Someone said, you know, oh, we can come back and pay tomorrow, they won't care. And I just said, no, we make our things. And so we paid a $5 bill with a 20. And we figured, well, if we come back tomorrow, we'll, we'll just consider it part of that. But I wanted to teach my, you know, my, my daughter that was with me that, you know, we pay our finances, even when it's not convenient. So, um, so we're not just teaching our kids, what are we doing? We're modeling. Wisely making choices and teaching our children who they really are. And why? So they can come to Christ. Make good decisions. Become unified and find joy in their families. Become like their Savior. And if they'll do that, they will accomplish all the things that they need. Okay. Other suggestions on how do you do this? 
if you go through the PowerPoints, we've given you some ideas. But there's two parts. You know, how do you help, help your kids, children understand who they are? And how do you help them be a benefit to the world? But if we can take both of those assignments to heart, we can do well. Uh, of course, I, I say that and realize, you know, my, my children struggle just like everybody else. So the nice thing about being a grandparent now is all I have to do is love them. And that's what I'm learning as a, as a parent too. You know, the time for teaching is over. I'll still teach by example and teach things like that. But now my job is just to love them, trying to support them and help them. And um, someone said that if, if parents acted more like grandparents, there would be a lot more love around. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Giving opportunities for experience. Yes, that's right. Real, real experiences uh, really helps. Yeah. When they have more than just theory, mm -hmm. you know, reading a book. Uh, an example is you know, we, we wanted our children to understand how to navigate an airport. Mm -hmm. so when we were living in Hawaii, we saw a lot of airports. And uh, a couple of women got old enough where we thought they could do it, and they were very young, like 10. Mm -hmm. We had the older ones navigate the airport. We just stood behind them. And uh, from that point on, they knew how to navigate the airport. So they had that experience more than just looking yeah. at them. And you've got to give them opportunities. You've got to give them opportunities to make mistakes. Because if, if all, you, all they ever do is do what you tell them to do, then there, there's no learning there. And think about how the Lord allows us to use our agency. And he's the most wisest parent around. So I think if we follow um, the Savior's example, we'll, we'll, make, we'll, we'll, we'll do a better job. Um, how about the decision to save for your children's missions and education. Is there anything in the scriptures that says? That says you, you have to pay for your kids' education? No. Now, do some of us have different scriptures? I know my patriarchal blessing. It says set aside a portion of your income to educate your children and send them on missions. Then do I have a different set? <laughs> Uh, yet for us, it was a little bit different. But not everyone has that, that requirement. Um, but then there's a challenge, too. What happens if your kids don't use the resources wisely? <laughs> we actually have <laughs> one child that if they save a certain amount of money, we'll match it. But they have to save their amount of money first. And the daughter here, here at BYU, and she didn't have the resources for her second semester. She came to me and she says, Dad, I don't have the money. I says, oh, that's too bad. You're not going to be able to go to school. Well, you mean you're going to keep me from not going to school in January just because I don't have the money? I said, yeah. I was not, I was not a favorite, pa favorite parent. So that daughter went <laughs> took three jobs over Christmas, and she made enough money that she could do that. Um, and then another daughter who hasn't probably been as wise on her finances as she should be, and she's getting really close to the amount of money that, she, that she's used. And we actually had to say, hey, you've only got this amount of money left. You know, how close are you to getting your degree? Because anything beyond this, you're going to have to, you're going to have to pay. And she's made some decisions where she started school a couple of times and then quit because she didn't. Um, because she decided she wanted to do something else. And so <laughs> this last year we said, look, if you start a semester and we help, and you quit in the middle of the semester, you have to pay back everything that we've contributed before we will give you any new money. And the amazing thing is that, that she's decided that she'll stay and, she's staying and finishing the semester. But, but we've got to be wise here. And if we choose to help, um, it's important. So what are the challenges of saving for your children's missions and education? Yeah. I think, you know, if there's anything you want to do as a family for a mission or education, uh -huh. you, know, you have to be disciplined to, to save for it. It's going to take time. And, you know, probably when you're raising your children there in their teenage years, it's probably some of the most expensive five to ten years of yeah. your life. And so you can't just think, oh, when my kids start turning, you know, 13 years old, I'll start saving for their mission or their yeah. marriage or whatever it is, you know, because kids start to do all sorts of things at that age. So. Yeah. 
you know, if you can start being disciplined and do it now, then it yeah. won't seem like such a big burden. When our kids, each of our kids were born, we put $1,000 in the account. And then later we've got to add to it. You realize that $1,000 over 20 years can be significant. Uh, again, well, I told you that we found that the markets paid about half of my kids' education. My, my, the, older, the younger ones right now, so my one daughter who's, uh, who's a, uh, she's essentially a sophomore at Dixie, realized just in this last year alone, her education money increased by 25% because the S&P is up 25%. So, you know, you know, putting, even though last year the market was off 6% on average, the market does okay. Um, but be wise in it. Other challenges? Yeah. Saying no. Yeah, no. <laughs> I had kids who came to me and said, Dad, will you co-sign on a car? And I just said, no. <laughs> it was pretty simple. And then we're not the favorite thing, so what they do, they went to the other, grand, the other set of parents and they co-signed on it. <laughs> but you know what, if you don't have the resources for it and the bank doesn't think you, think you can pay it back, well, why, what do I know more as a, as a parent? And I don't think you should be you know, going into debt for a car in the first place. Um, and, and then what do you do? Your kids say, oh, you're, you're the meanest parent. So what do I do is you just get in front of them. I say, I know I'm the meanest parent around. You know, and I'm, I'm no, the worst parent ever was. Uh, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> but other, other challenges, discipline, saying no. Yeah. It kind of, kind of goes along with both those, but just having a bigger picture of what you're actually yeah. trying to help your kids with. Like, if you're saving for your kids' education and missions, and then they decide they don't want to go on an education, they don't want to go on a mission. They don't want to go to school. Yeah. What? Yeah. Like what? Not just what are you going to do with that money, but what were you trying to help yeah. kids with, and how yeah. are you going to still teach them that lesson? So I've had, we've had three kids go on missions. We have four that haven't. Had one that, you know, she she put in her papers and they says, you know, we just don't think it's a good time for you right now. So that was hard for her. But you know what? If they don't go on it, that's okay. And then also saving for weddings too. But those are all those are all big things there. But what's your vision? And you know, and then I, I look in my family, my wife has her degree, and I like what that's, that's done. And so it's, I think it's important that boys and girls, young men and young women all get their degree, because it makes a difference, you know, if, if possible. If you can do it, and not go into too much debt. Yeah. 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 And the nicest newest cell phone in the, in the car. Yeah. And so we're not doing it from that just like we are. Yeah. yeah. And too many times we do compare. And are, are we be good, being good examples to our kids? My wife has some money that she set aside. And she just went and bought a, an iPhone 11. So what happens is I've got her, I've got her old one, and then we just pass my, my phone down to another daughter. <laughs> so I haven't, bought a, I haven't bought a cell phone in... 15 years, I just get the hand-me-downs, and I'm happy with the hand-me-downs. Uh, Tyler. Um, my parents didn't like, want us to feel entitled, so they didn't give us allowances. Rather, they rewarded behavior like if we got good grades, if we didn't get cavities, it would give us a big chunk of change. Uh -huh. in, in our case, we, we paid our kids. We said, your job is school. So you got $10 for an A, you got $20 bonus if they're all A's, and you got a $20 bonus if they're straight A's. <laughs> and we also had contracts with them too. You want to drive? You have to have a 3.7. You want to play sports? You have to have a 3.7. Um, <clears throat> one of my daughters, she started her, her freshman year, we started this in high school. She says, how you doing? She goes, I'm doing great. Dad, doing really well. A couple weeks later, hey, how's school going? Oh, school's great. She was playing soccer. She was playing basketball. Um, Went to parent-teacher night, she had like a 2-7. She was just having way too much fun. And so we pulled her aside and we just said, hey, you know, you, you know our rules. And you are a significant distance away from what we said for you to be able to play sports. What will you do? She thought for a little while and she says, okay, I'll, I'll drop basketball. But I'll play, I still want to play soccer. And I said, do, do you think you can bring it up by the end of the semester? She says, yeah, I think I can, Dad. 
by the end of the semester, she had like a 3.6999. <laughs> so we were happy with it. She continued to play soccer, and she played soccer for BYUH. So there was a scholarship there. So, you know, y you have to work with your kids individually. But you need to figure out how you're going to do it and what you're going to do. And realize things will change. We've gone from allowances to no allowances to paying for things. But we found what, what we like is that each kids have daily responsibilities and then they have we weekly responsibilities. Chen Chen's here. She was a foreign exchange student that lived with us for two years. So she comes from her high-rise apartment in Changsha. And she, all of a sudden she comes to a house where she has to work in the yard mowing the lawn and edging and using all these crazy tools. But, but it teaches them how to work. It, 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 when I was a kid growing up, my dad was in construction and I would go swing a hammer every, every weekend to make, because I could make more money working for him than working in the fields. Or, you know, and I, but my kids didn't have that. And so what did I do is where I, we taught them how to work in the yard so they can all mow and edge and blow. They don't like the chainsaws very much, but, but they can handle most of the other tools. So, so the key is, again, be disciplined. Just, be, just because you have the money doesn't mean you have to spend it. Again, having an accounts for us, catch your vision, why it's important, and avoid comparisons. <clears throat> again, we borrow money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people who don't care. If we truly understood how little other people thought about us, we wouldn't worry what they thought about us. Okay. So let's say you decide to... <clears throat> well, <clears throat> let's come across on your PFP education and mission plans. What's your vision, your goals? What are you planning to do? What are your plans and strategies? How will you help? How much will you help? Why will you help? And then what vehicles will you use? What are your constraints and accountability? Um, is education important? This is, came out in 2012, but I thought even though the numbers are a little bit low, it's still good. It says, without a high school, not a high school graduate, you'll make about 24000 a year or about a million dollars. Notice what happens as you add more education. High school diploma, it's worth about $1.3 million over your lifetime. Some college, no degree, 1.5 associates. Here's where many of you, bachelors, and here's where most of you guys are, masters, 2.7. Is there a correlation between education and earning power? And I think the answer is yes. Like if you get a doctoral degree or a professional degree. Again, kind of the research has shown. What have our, what have our leaders said about education? Is it a good investment? And again, what I'm doing is I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> you guys are here, you guys are here ready to graduate with your masters and your MBAs and things like this. Max, just some interesting thoughts. Education can prove to be the wisest and most profitable investment you'll ever make. Education is the key that unlocks the door. Just a couple other ones. Some people say, you know, this says here, BYU, enter to learn, go forth to make money, right? Isn't that what it says? <laughs> the more the education you receive, the greater your opportunity to serve. And you know what? And you can serve so much better when you're not worrying where the next dollar is coming from. You know, is it cheap? So my question next is, If you choose to help, if you choose to help, is there a priority of, are there better ways to save? You know, just we talked about the priority of selecting investment vehicles, it's the same way here, kind of your priority of money. Here's kind of your, Priority here. So again, free money. You know if you put money in a 529 plan, you can put t up to 2,000 
um, a year per child, and you can get a 5% tax credit against your Utah taxes. Is that free money? Yeah, that's as much free money as your company match. So you can do that. Scholarships, boy, if you can get someone else to pay for your education, it's so much better. Um, second thing here is family money, personal sa savings. You want to start the process of financial independence as soon as you can. It, it makes me feel good. I talk with my kids and they talk about, yeah, I've saved X thousand dollars so far for things. And I've got one son that's probably going to go on for a PhD and I've got other ones who are going on for kind of more advanced degrees. Um, and, and try to help your children, but don't do it all. Don't take the responsibility from them. Employment research has found that, you know, if, if you work 10 to 15 hours a week, that's, that's probably optimal. Less than that if you're in high school. But I found that when my kids who worked, they were better able to manage their time and generally their grades were better as well too. Um, and realize that most of us worked. I worked in the MTC teaching Mandarin Chinese. You know, so, so realize that I did construction on the side as well. Loans. <laughs> Just be, be careful with the loans. Remember, you have to pay it back. I think one of the things that we do not teach very well is we don't teach people the impact of taxes. The fact that if, you know, if you're in the 22% federal tax bracket and 5% state tax bracket, plus you pay your tithes and offerings, you have to earn a dollar, a dollar 56 for every dollar you spend, including to pay back. And I don't think people realize that, that, that impact there. And I don't think it's taught very well because then you'd see how much the impact of taxes is on what you do. Okay. So what are the different types of vehicles? What are the different vehicles? What have you guys heard? What different vehicles have you heard about saving for saving for education? Yeah. 529 plans, there's actually two there. Um, tuition and the savings plan. Other vehicles? Yeah. Education IRA. Education IRA, which are both very good ones. I, I use both of those. My favorite is the 529 plan. A um, couple of other ones too. We talked about your series EE and I bonds. So I've, I've done I bonds too, which are kind of nice. Um, and then there's other things, ones without tax benefits. Yes? I have a question about the 529. You can only use those on education expenses, right? Correct. So what, I mean, what happens if like you're saving for a child and then they decide not to go to school or something like that? Um, what can you do with that? Money? So what happens then you pay a 10% penalty and then, and then you can use it any way you want. So there's a tax penalty there. What are some of the, I guess, different pros and cons to 529 education IRA? And okay. I guess from you, do you recommend one of those when saving for a child's education or do you just do regular? I, account or. Okay, so here's, here's what I recommend. So my, my favorite is the 529 savings plan. The main reason there is it's, it's fairly flexible. You can even buy a computer with it. So I bought a computer with, with it. Um, the other thing I like about that, I like the 5% tax credit. Okay, my second one is education, um, education IRA is very much like a Roth IRA. We put that. Each of these things you have to have a separate, you can't have one account for all your kids, it's one for each of your kids. So I've had seven education IRA, seven 529 plans. You know. Do the uh, IRAs, um, I know in a regular IRA you have to be a certain age in order not to hit a penalty. How does that work with an education IRA? Um, you ha have to use it by age 30. By age 30, yeah. okay. So um, let's do this, let's hand this out. Here's just uh, education savings vehicles. It kind of compares each of those. Each of the things, so you can be looking at that while I am uh, talking about these things too. Um, I bonds. I can't imagine why anyone would do a, a, a double E bond. Notice you're making 2.2% till the end of April, April 30th, 2020. So nice thing about I bonds is, again, they're already state tax free and if you use it for qualified educational expenses, they become uh, federal tax free as well. If you Take it out before five years, there's a um, three month penalty on interest, and the minimum holding period of, of one year. So as we talked about with cash management, the first year is, they're not really a very good vehicle, but after 12 months you can. 
Um, notice, notice um, if you make too much money, over 151,000, you can't deduct the interest on these. Um, but it's still a good vehicle. Notice the rates here, 2.2%. You can see basically over the last 20 years what rates have done. And now notice your double E bonds. I, I have no idea why someone would buy a double E bond. <laughs> but, but the point here is with an I bond, there is the risk that you have 0% return. So you've actually had three periods, uh, three six month periods, but where you, where you have 0% return. But on average, you're, you're you know, one and a half to two and a half percent which is not a bad deal considering it's, it's guaranteed. So if you have a total there, is that your return minus your inflation? What is your total? Right, so there's a way you calculate. So that's, it's a fixed return plus your inflation component. And then uh, realize that this is every six months, so you uh, multiply it by two. So that, that gives you your, basically the 2.2% is your total return. So what I like about these things here is, is Again, remember, the first, I told you the first time we bought them was because we needed extra miles. <laughs> so you could buy them with a credit card. That probably wasn't a good reason to buy them. But then I find out, and so what we would do is we'd pay tuition from our kids, and then, would, uh, then we would get, take a bond and uh, cash it in. And so again, they, not, they were not only federal tax-free, but state tax, or state tax-free, but federal tax-free as well. And realize for an I-bond, it's only good for tuition and fees. You can't use it for room and board. You can't use it for computers. So it's very narrow here. Nathan. Um, I was wondering, with an education IRA, or as a parent, are you still in control of it? Yes, it, you're in control. You know, if they don't go to college, you can just take right. a 10% penalty and pull it out? You can. Okay. Correct. Um, education is the second one here. Tax-free. You choose your investments. So basically, my, I, we did my education IRA with, um, with Vanguard. You can do it with Schwab, Fidelity, any of those things. And then you can put anything you want in it. And we just use, it was either, we just use like VFINX, the S&P 500, or you could do a total stock market index as well. You can use this also for elementary, secondary, and post-secondary. See, so you could also use it for high school expenses as well. Uh, disadvantages, you can only do 2,000 a year. If you make more than the, the Roth limits of 220,000, you can't, you can't use these. And then funds must be used by age 30. So what, what you can do is you can roll them down to other kids. And like I said, if you, uh, if the kids don't use, tax with a 10% penalty. Okay, so I, I like this one here. Um, but again, 529 plans, there's really two 529 plans. One is called a prepaid tuition plan. And what this one does is certain schools have this where you can actually go pay a certain amount of money now. And then when your child goes to that school in 15 years, their tuition is paid. And so if that's the case, um, those are good. The downside is what, what, what if your child doesn't want to go to that school? And so that's why I like the savings plan a little bit better. Um, in addition, so the savings plan basically says, okay, you put this money here. And then what happens is I've got three kids at three different schools. And as, okay, we need to pay our tuition here, so we'll pay our tuition here. And then I reimburse myself from the the 529 plans, or I reimburse myself from the education IRA plans. And so that, is, that has helped us. Utah has one of the best 529 plans. I think it's like in the top. Yeah, it, it, it's been in the top, top five for the last like 10 or 15 years. Yeah, so if you're in Utah, that's... So is it different rate from state to state? Right, it is different from state to state. And I know the guy who put it together, a guy by the name of Ed Alter, and he's brilliant. He was brilliant. And it's just one of the best plans around. Again, they use all Vanguard funds. And so what you, 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 buy, you invest in a Vanguard fund and you're paying 12 or 13 basis points, uh, UESP, Utah's plan pays like three basis points or two, two basis points. <coughs> Again, realize that, that each state has a different plan. If you're in Colorado, can you use Utah's plan? Yeah. You just don't get the tax benefit. And the thing that I like about Utah's plan is I like the tax benefit. <laughs> so Utah's, in 2019, you can put up 2,000 per child or 4,000 for uh, a couple per child and you get a 5% tax credit on your Utah taxes. So that's $200 of free money per child if you decide to do that. <laughs> I just want to be careful that you, like, well, we have this conversation with my accountant you don't want to put like your retirement in there. No, right? you don't. Because if they don't, whatever they don't use, you're going to get 
Yeah. Right. <coughs> And how do you figure out how much you should save for your kids' education? Time, money. Yeah. So you, you've got the tools. I know how much. <laughs> I had a daughter who came to me and she says, I'm, we, I want to go to the Seattle Art Institute. And, you know, and that's a little bit far away from here. <laughs> and we says, okay, tell, tell, us how much, um, tell us how much it is. What's tuition? She figured out tuition. Okay, what's room and board? Figured out what are books? And then the key one was, what's the average salary of people living here? And the, the average salary was like $35,000. So she had like $250,000 of expenses, and she'd make a salary of $35,000. And so, so we says, well, why don't you look at BYU? And we had one of the uh, photography professors here. And so we actually went through and helped her figure out what's tuition. And then if she's here, she gets half tuition from, from what? Uh, because I, I teach here. And what's room and board and things like that. And what's the average salary? The average salary of those coming out are like 65000 And so, so this one would come here in the, basically like 50000 or 60000 something like that. And she'd make 65000 and she decided to come here. Of course, it didn't, it didn't hurt the fact that we says, okay, we have X amount of dollars here saved for you. And anything beyond that, you have to pay that. And BYU would roughly cover what we, what we had saved. So... So be wise in what you do, um, and make sure, uh, make sure your kids know what they want. Yeah. I've already answered this, but with 529 plans, are there restrictions from state to state about which schools are eligible? Like, if you have a Texas plan, is that eligible? And like, yes. New York school? Right. So basically, our, uh, so with the 529 plans, you can go any qualified U.S.-based school. There's a whole list. So. Um, so it's, it's pretty, pretty pervasive. I mean, most, of the, most, most qualified educational companies are on that list. So there. And then the last thing, just tax efficient. Wise investing, we've taught you how to do that. You know, low cost, tax efficient. You know, know your, know your tax rate, invest long term, invest wisely and receive tax exempt income. And then you've got what are called custodial accounts. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do this. <laughs> the, the problem is, and I think it's actually 21 now, but it, you really lose control you do. if you put it in. And it's, yeah. you just, you put it in, but then at 18, they get all the money that's in there in one lump sum. That is if you or let them know that they have them. We just didn't tell our kids. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah it's, it's, it, uh, right, it used to be a good deal 20 years ago, but, but now it's not. So I, I don't recommend these here. So th those are the lists. You could also use a taxable account. Again, what do I recommend? The nice thing about a taxable account, you have to pay the taxes every year, but you, you, can, you, can, um, you can continue to use it for whatever is necessary. You have to pay the taxes on just your earnings? Yeah, right. Just earnings each year. Okay. But they're taxed in the preferential rate. Yeah. Right. It's just dividends. It's yeah. your interest you get. Organized. And usually if, if you're an index fund, investing in index funds, just like we talk about, how much do they distribute? Yeah. Jessica. I just have maybe a dumb question. But with these taxable accounts, you know, remember when we went through and we like created some person like, like Jeff Bezos or something like that? Uh -huh. No, you, you can put money in taxable accounts and you can put money in retirement accounts. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're called there was an option. Right, so brokerage, mutual fund accounts, those are all taxable accounts. Okay. Yeah, so if, you, if, if it's in, in a non retirement account, it's a taxable account. What, what type of accounts do you recommend putting mission money into? Um, I just as just a a standard, taxable. A taxable account. Because, okay. you know, and that's kind of where we are. Fewer ways to save. Really, I think the best thing is just ta being tax efficient. Okay. So what we've done is we put missions, uh, missions and weddings. <laughs> and we, we started with our custody accounts, and, and now I would just say, just put them in a, a, a taxable account. Um, there are some institutions in Utah that will give you some interest to manage yeah. if it's a mission account. Yeah. Okay. So, and then custodial accounts, again, I just don't recommend. It's 18 or 21, depending on, uh, depending on where you are. So having a child that just comes out with you know, $30,000 of 
money in their name, it's, it's, it's probably not that. Uh, it's, it's not a good idea. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> but you, permissions don't count as charitable contributions. Um, what, what you do is you, you donate. Uh, in, in our case, what we do is we pay our mission funds with appreciated securities. And so if you, if you deduct, um, if, you're, if you use itemized deductions, that can help you. So, yeah, it does. One thing you have to watch out for when they're paying for missions and trying to bunch charitable contributions that the IRS could look at, sometimes they don't, is if you're still claiming that person as a dependent, sometimes they'll come in and they'll say that because they're on a mission and they're doing this, they're not your dependent anymore yeah. because you're not providing comparative to what the church is providing yeah. for their needs. And so there's, there's Yeah, I realize there's when, when your children that. are on missions, you, they're not considered yeah. independent. So there's, Sadly. There's, there's a thing about that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So the question is, each of you have to put together. How do you create your, your mission and education plans? Do you have to help your kids on their missions? Yeah, I don't think there's anything that says you don't have to help them with your education. You may desire to. Um, but here's just, here's just some thoughts. If you choose not to help, at least be willing to tell them, you know, we're not going to be able to help you. My parents were sure. He says, okay, we will help you about... $125 a month. It was, that was $125 my entire education. But in that, that, of course, way back then, that, you know, back in prehistoric times, that, 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 that helped out a lot. Covered food, right? Yeah, covered food. <laughs> my parents were also smart. They kind of thought most of their kids would go to BYU, so they, they bought the house for my grandparents when my, uh, my oldest siblings were going to school. And then after my younger brother graduated, they sold it off, and that made it, that made it interesting, it worked out well for them. But, but the key here, you, th there's reasons why you might not help. You know, if you sacrifice to achieve it, it'll mean a lot more. And you know, some families just don't have the resources. You know, we just know we're not going to be able to have the resources for them. So if you choose not to help, make sure you make, make that, that known. If you choose to help, you know, it, it, in our case, we chose to help with part of it. In fact, most of our kids said, okay, Dad, I've got the money saved here. Uh, you know, you just take it out of this account. And what did we do? We totally went against everything we taught them. <laughs> we kept their money in the account. We paid for the mission because we wanted the blessings. And the blessings came. And when they came back, they still had the money in their account. But ideas might include vision, goals. And here's just some plans and strategies. You know, we encourage you as soon as you have kids, this, if you've got some way to set some money aside, starting then, uh, again, you've got time value of money on your side. Contribute a certain dollar amount. We'll match you, whatever, that, whatever the multiple is. What's a, what's a good goal in case, you know, we'll talk a little bit about a giving plan. My wife and I had a goal at one time we wanted to s support X number of missionaries at once. And so what we did is we realized that, you know, what are the big ones? Taking care of the Lord's poor, tithing, taking care of the Lord's poor, and taking care of the Lord's missionaries. <laughs> you know, be generous in those, and the Lord seems to, to take care of his people. Uh, but one of these times you get bored, come by, and we'll tell you what that goal is. And at one time, I got really close. Most of the time, you know. But, but I mean, what are your plans and strategies? What are the things you want? And if you choose to help with education, what are you doing there? What are your vision, goals, plans and strategies? But the, you know, part of being an adult is, is that we plan ahead for these things. Plan ahead for retirement. Plan ahead for important things to us. Uh, as I was talking earlier, um, my wife and I just put our estate plan together. We're going to take half of our estate when we die, and we're going to put it into just for, it's going to pay the missions and education, help pay for missions and education for the kids and the grandkids. Because I think it's going to be tough for them to go to school. And if we can help them out just a little bit, it won't cover everything. We've actually talked about, okay, if you take an institute class, we'll pay more. And if you take, you know, not, you'll get less. But that's okay. 
it's people up, um, and it's up to the in individuals. And then what's also, what else is important to us? That our kids get together, so we'll take part of it. And we'll do a vacation fund. So every year, family can get together on various vacations and we can kind of help them. Because we'd like our kids to grow up knowing their cousins and working together. And then we'll, we'll take a little bit and just give them so they're, they're, they're happy when we die. <laughs> so have a little bit to play with. But the point here is, is we need to think through these issues. Think through what's important to you. And is it important for, is education important? And in our case, our, our family said it really is. I'm so thankful that my wife has her degree. And it gives her a sense of self-accomplishment and, you know, helps her. And I, I believe it's the responsibility of spouses for the self-esteem of the others. And so as we help each other to grow and to progress and to become more Christ-like, we'll, we'll do so much better. And then, what are your constraints and what are your accountabilities? So questions. Questions on saving for your kids' missions. How did your parents save for yours? Connor, how did your parents save for your missions in education? Uh, Hugh. Hugh. Um, I, you guys switched. <laughs> Sorry. I, had, I, had, I paid for mine. Okay, you paid for your own. Other people whose parents helped pay, do you know how they did it? You know, with my wife, her, her parents paid she ten, $10 a week, she'd get a check. So my parents use a custodial account and cause put in, like, birthdays and Christmas. Put money in birthdays money and Christmas. money we got from grandparents' birthdays and Christmas. We that's actually, a, that's actually a smart idea. I'll just went to an account. Yeah, it just went into, it went into the account. Probably wouldn't do it in a custody account, but... Uh, but yeah, I think that's a neat idea. Other things? Jessica, what'd your parents do? Okay, part of the monthly budget. Yeah. Of course, with seven kids, in, in our case, it would that would be a significant part of the monthly budget. <laughs> and and the nice thing is, if you can plan for it, you can start savings now. And and right now, like I said, we have three kids with three different you know, tuition bills that are, that are going to come due in December, some we've already paid. But it, it's no impact on our spending because the money's already been set aside. And also with the market, you know, like I said, the market up 25% year to date, that's, that's helped the amounts that, the, that we have. It's increased the amounts that, that my kids have. Okay. One final thing is realize that what I do, I teach. The things I, I'm not teaching you anything, anything different than what I've done in, in, uh, in my career, in my life. So we talk about setting money aside. <coughs> and what have we done? Uh, we just stuck it in an S&P index fund or an S&C total market index fund. When we talk about setting, uh, paying uh, money aside too, we had money comes out of our checking account, 20 bucks a month into 529 plans. You know, there's nothing that I teach that's different than what I do. And the fact that, that we're able to retire next year and do whatever we would, we would want to do, wherever the Lord would have us do, at least in my experience, is that the things that we teach are good. It doesn't mean that we, we haven't made mistakes. Most of our stories are because we've made mistakes and done stupid things like custody accounts and <laughs> things like that. But, but the, the things we teach are the way that I think it, it is not only how my wife and I have done it, but how we think it's a good way. And we think that there's principles behind each of the things that we teach. And as you guys, in each of these areas, as you think through what are your vision and what are your goals, and what are your guiding principles to take you to your vision and goals, that will lead you to your, your plans and your strategies and then hopefully your constraints and accountability as well. Okay, takeaways. Hammond, what are your takeaways for today?
Yeah. Use the power of the stock market to achieve your long-term goals. Ethan. Um, what I have is this importance of teaching your children about financial yeah. <coughs> literacy, I guess, and just not always bailing them out, but teaching them, even when they're young, about yeah. how to save money and spend their own money. Yeah. Teaching your children. Robert. Um, I like that we said give your kids the opportunity to make mistakes. Yeah. It's better for them to learn when it's cheap than learning. Yeah. And it, the, the earlier they are to make the mistakes, the cheaper it is to. Okay, Connor. Um, make sure you know what is or constitutes a qualified expense yeah. in those accounts as education. And make sure you know what constitutes a qualified expense. In the last year, the 529 allowed computers to be a qualified education expense. Before then, it wasn't. So it kind of kind of changes. Janiel, you get to be our last one. Yeah, do your homework because there's a difference between states. So here's my takeaways. Teach your children as soon as they're able to make decisions. Don't reward bad behavior. If you wait too long, it's too late. Number two, you don't have to pay for your kids' education and missions. But, it's, but if you do, prepare, uh, if you choose to let them know, prepare a plan and follow your plan. Number three is every person radiates what he or she really is. It's not what we are, or it is what we are and what we become that affects the people around us. Radiate well. Thanks, everyone. We will see you on Wednesday. So we'll have every...